Hey everybody, David Shapiro here with a video. So, um, one, I've been scarce and I apologize. I am feeling better, um, recovering from burnout, although I still need like some days just doing nothing. Um, but anyways, um, so y'all are really clamoring for me to continue the, um, the, the Q and a chat, but not that one. Um, uh, and then the salience and anticipating, um, you know, and AutoMuse and all that fun stuff. So all these chatbots, um, I will continue working on them, but I kind of got to a, a stopping point where uh, basically the, the problem is memory, right? So whether you're looking at hundreds of scientific articles or an arbitrarily long uh, chat conversation or an entire novel, um, semantic search is just not good enough breaking it up and chunking and, and stuff. So we need a more sophisticated, a more organized uh, memory system for AI, for autonomous AI. And so this is what I proposed. Um, and so basically there's, there's, there's uh, episodic memory. There's two primary kinds of memory in the human brain. There's episodic memory, which is chronologically linear. So that is the lived experience, the lived narrative. That is the uh, a linear account of the sensations, you know, your external senses and your internal thoughts. Um, those are the two primary things So you got sensations, thoughts, and then in thoughts are um, decisions, uh, memories that have been recalled, so on and so forth. But you forget most of this. Most of this is noise, right? You don't need to remember that you remembered something at all times. You just have like, oh, I'm thinking about, you know, that time I went to the beach, right? And then, you know, anyways, so you don't necessarily need to record all your thoughts, but you definitely need to record uh, to a certain extent what's coming in, and then you 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 slot that into some kind of framework. Um, so this is going to be the underpinning uh, work, and I have written in all three of my books so far that like I was putting off memory systems because it is a super non-trivial problem, and it turns out it's now the problem that like we all have to solve. So I'm working with. Um, a few people uh, on various cognitive architectures, and we're actually going to have some demos coming up in the coming weeks. Because um, fortunately, I'm no longer the only person working on cognitive architectures. Yay! Um, the idea is catching on. Um, so with that being said, though, um, the, the, this, is, this is a very difficult problem. And so the idea is, okay, so we've got raw data coming in, right? It's, it's unstructured. The only, well, it's, it's semi-structured. The only structure is you know what time series it has. But other, other than that, you don't know what, um, what the topic is going to be. And the topics are going to change, right? And there might be gaps in the time. So what we do is we take a chunk of logs, an arbitrary chunk of logs based on that are temporally bounded, and you get an executive summary of that information. And in this chunk, so this is like going to be another JSON file or whatever. You have pointers back to the original log so that you can reconstruct the memory because using sparse pointers is actually a, a big thing that human brains do. Um, and so then this is basically a, a, a very sparse summary, and I'll show you what I mean by sparse summary. And then finally, as you accumulate more of these summaries, you eventually merge these into a knowledge graph or a cluster them and then use that clustering um, to make uh, uh, to make like wiki articles or KB articles, and give me just a second. Sorry, I needed my coffee. Okay, so anyways, um, yeah. So this is the scheme, and I spent a long time talking through this with uh, Chat GPT four. So you can see this is a whoops. This is a come on. Why is the why is the Okay, it doesn't want to scroll. Anyways, you can see it is a very, very long conversation. I talked through code, I talked through the math, I talked through the concept. And so anyways, at the very end of it, I said, can you write an executive summary of the problem we're trying to solve here? And so this is, just taking a step back for a second, I am using GPT-4 to help solve the problems of AGI, artificial general intelligence, or what I call autonomous cognitive entities. So the problem at hand involves designing an efficient memory system for an autonomous cognitive entity or an ACE 
that can manage a large and constantly growing corpus of text data generated through thoughts, inputs, and outputs. This data can accumulate to hundreds of gigabytes per year, potentially reaching millions or billions of individual logs. The primary challenge is to organize and compress these logs into a manageable set of knowledge base articles while retaining as much meaningful information as possible. This is such a concise summary, I could not have done better. Our proposed uh, our, see it's, it's already the, the collective because it understands that we're collaborating. Our proposed solution involves a multi-level approach with the first level being the consolidation of raw logs into roll-up summaries, so that's this. Um, these roll-ups serve as compressed representations of the original logs, reducing the total number of records. Uh, then we employ a gating or threshold function to determine whether a roll-up is semantically similar enough to an existing KB articles, or if it, if it should be added as a new article. This approach allows the KB to adapt organically to the evolving data while maintaining scalability. The key aspects to consider in this solution are the choice of similarity threshold and semantic similarity measure, as well as the balance between number of KB articles and their quality. Periodic evaluation and fine tuning of the system will help ensure its continued effectiveness as data grows. Okay, so this is a very, very condensed text summary of this system. <clears throat> um, and then, so I mentioned sparsity, right? So I've been reading this book, Behave. Um, so as always, neuroscience and in life inspires what I'm working on. And one of the one of the experiments, or actually several of the experiments that he talks about in this book, has to do with linguistic priming. And so an example of linguistic priming in humans in psychology is that if you use just a few words, um, kind of placed arbitrarily, it will really change someone's cognition. So one example was they did a test with Asian women, and if you remind the Asian women of the stereotype that Asians are better at math before giving them a math test, they do better. If you remind them of the stereotype that, uh, that women are bad at math, then they do worse. Um, and then, of course, if you just give them neutral priming, they kind of, you know, pour form in the middle. Um, and there's plenty of examples of priming. Um, Darren, Darren Brown, the, the British dude, the mentalist, he used uh, a lot of priming to get people to, like, do all kinds of cool stuff. This was back in the 90s. Um, but, like, one, ex one experiment that he did was he had a bunch of, like, marketing guys, and he put them in a car and drove them around town, and he drove them by, like, a specific set of billboards. And so they were primed with images and words. And then he asked them to solve a particular marketing problem. And he had almost exactly predicted what they were going to produce based on how they had been primed. Now, I noticed that large language models can also be primed. And so what I mean by primed is that by just sprinkling in a few of the correct words and terms, it will then be able to reproduce or reconstruct whatever it is that you're talking about. So what I want to do is I want to show you that because this this um, really high density um, way of compressing things, what I call sparse priming representations, is going to be super important um, for managing uh, artificial uh, cognitive entity or AGI memories because here's the thing. Large language models already have a tremendous amount of foundational knowledge. So all you need to do is prime it with just a few rules and statements and assertions um, that will allow it to um, just basically kind of remember or reconstruct the concept. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and put it into a new chat. And we're going to go to GPT-4. And I'll say the following is a sparse uh, priming representation of a concept or topic. Um, oh, wow. They they reduced it from 100 messages to 50. <laughs> I guess they're busy. <laughs> uh, unsurprising. Um, please reconstruct the topic or concept in detail. And so here's what we'll do. So with just a handful of statements and assertions, I will show you that GPT-4 in the form of chat GPT-4 is highly capable of reconstituting this very complex uh, topic 
just by virtue of the fact that it, um, it already has a tremendous amount of background knowledge and processing capability. Um, okay. <clears throat> So there we go. So the autonomous uh, cognitive entity is an advanced artificial intelligence system to design it. Yep. Okay. There you go. Um, so it's kind of it's it's reconstructing what this multi-level approach. So what it's doing here is it's kind of re restating uh, everything. Um, but what you'll see is that it will be able to confabulate and kind of fill in the blanks. And so by having a sparse representation it kind of guides how it's going to confabulate. And this can be used for all kinds of tasks, right? So some of my Patreon supporters, I won't, I'm not going to give anything away because I respect my Patreon supporters privacy, but they ask me like, how do I represent X, Y, or Z? And what I'm going to say is this is a way to represent a lot of stuff. Um, what, whatever, whatever your domain of expertise is, you can ask it to do what I did in there, which is say, just give me a short list of you know, statements, assertions, explanations, such that a subject matter expert could re um, could uh, reconstitute it. Um, there we go. And so here, here it's it's figuring this out um, as it goes. Periodic evaluation and necessary to continued efficiency. This may be a, a, a involve adjusting the similarity threshold, refining semantic similarity measure, modifying other aspects. Uh, sparse priming representation is a technique used in conjunction to facilitate knowledge transfer and reconstruction. SPR, concise statements, are generated to summarize. Yeah, so it even understands just by virtue of saying this is an SPR and a brief definition, it understands the implications. Um, there you go. So now that it has, has, um, has reconstituted it, we can say, okay, um, great, thanks. Um, can you discuss how we could uh, go about implementing this for a chatbot. And so again, because, um, because, uh, because GPT-4 already knows a whole bunch of coding and data and stuff, um, it's gonna be able to talk through the process. Um, so this is going to, okay, I don't think it fully I gave it very simple instructions. Let's see where it goes. Because often what happens is, and someone someone pointed this out to me, is that it'll kind of talk through the problem and then give you the answer. So I learned the hard way, just be patient. What it's basically doing is it's talking itself through um, the, the problem and the solution. So anyways, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know why I'm so hoarse. Um, but yeah, so this is, this is what I'm working on right now. And this is going to have implications for, for all all chatbots, but also all autonomous AI. Because again, um, you know, this is, this is like the first two minutes of conversation. But what happens when you have a million logs? What happens when you have a billion logs? So one thing that I suspect will happen is um, the number of, whoops, nah, come back. <laughs> no, um, I suspect that the number of logs will go up geometrically. But what I also suspect is that the um, is that the number of KB articles will actually go up and approach an asymptote. How do you get it to stop? There you go. So I think I think that this is kind of how it'll look. Where like when your when your ace is new, when it's young, it'll be creating a bunch of new KB articles. Uh, very quickly, but then over time, the number of KB articles will taper off because say for instance, there's only a finite amount of information to learn about you, and then there'll be a very uh, slow trickle as your life progresses, right? Um, and we can also exclude KB articles about basic world knowledge, right? All it needs, all your ACE needs is KB articles about truly new, novel, and unique information. It doesn't need to record uh, a world model. The world model is baked into GPT-4 and future models. Now, one other thing was um, because this is kind of incrementally adding the KB articles, um, let's see what it came up with. Okay, so talk through the problem. Um, one thing is that uh, I asked it for the pros and cons. So right here, uh, using a gating or, and this is, this is how sophisticated it is. Um, using a gating or threshold function to compare rollups against existing KBs can be a viable alternative to clustering. So basically what we were exploring was 
what if we use a clustering algorithm to to um, figure out the chunks? But then I was like, okay, but we're not gonna we're not gonna regenerate the uh, the KB articles every single time because that's gonna be prohibitively expensive. So what if we treat it more incrementally? Um, Let's see, this approach involves comparing semantic similarity between a new rollup and existing KB articles if it doesn't meet a predetermined threshold. Okay, so the pros, it's simple. This approach is conceptually simple and can be easier to implement compared to clustering algorithms. Yes, scalability, as new rollups are processed individually, the computational complexity of updating KB articles grows linearly with the number of rollups, making it more scalable. Dynamic growth, the number of KB articles can grow organically with the addition of new rollups. Um, and then the cons, it very rightly... Um, identify suboptimal organization because we're not using global clustering, that's fine. Redundancy, there's a risk of creating uh, similar KB articles um, depending on the semantic similarity and then parameter sensitivity, so on and so forth. Now, that being said, there's a final step that we were that I was uh, going to talk about, which is every now and then we should do a re-indexing event. And so basically what that says is when, you're, when your ACE is offline during the dream sequence, right? So real-time learning, it can update the KB articles in real time. But then the dream sequence, it will delete all the KB articles, cluster the chunks based on semantic similarity, and then based on those chunks, write a whole new set of KB articles. And so every now and then, your autonomous cognitive entity is going to update its entire internal wiki. Um, and then these internal wikis are going to be the primary source of information for your uh, for your for your cognitive entity. And so instead of searching millions of logs, you're going to be searching hundreds or maybe a couple thousand KB articles, um, which is a much more tractable problem um, to find the correct thing. And also they can be cross-linked to each other, right? Because these KB articles, these wikis. Um, can be nodes in a knowledge graph, which means it's like, so my fiance was like, okay, so I was explaining it to her and she's like, so what if it has, what if it has a, um, an article on me and an article on her, would it link the two of us and say that like we're engaged and you know, our relationship has been X uh, long. And I'm like, yes, we could probably do that. It might also topically. Um, so in terms of the kinds of topics, here's another important thing. In terms of kinds of topics, we're probably going to have have it focus on people, events, um, things like objects, um, as well as concepts. So a concept could be like the concept of the autonomous cognitive entity. So people, events, things, and concepts. Um, and uh, included in things are like places, right? So like the year 1000 AD. The, the place, Paris, France, right? So those are all um, viable nodes for uh, a knowledge graph. So that's that's kind of where we're at. Um, yeah, I think that's all I'm gonna do today because like this is a lot and you can see that this conversation was very long. <laughs> and uh, But yeah, so let me know what you think in the comments. We are continuing to work. Um, I had a few other things that I was gonna say, but I forgot them. This is the most important thing, and this is this is the hardest problem I'm working on. And once I unlock this, it's going to unlock a lot more work. Because think about think about breaking. What if these logs, instead of like our conversation, what if these logs are scientific papers, or what if these logs are scenes in a book? Right. Pretty much everything can be represented this way, I think. Um, and then once you have these higher order abstractions. And all of them point back. So here's another really important thing that I forgot to mention, is that there's metadata attached with each of these um, entities that points back to the original. So you can you can still reconstruct the original information. So if you have like you know a topical article here, it'll point to all the chunks that were in that cluster that um, that helped create it, and then each of those chunks will point back to the original logs. So you have kind of a pyramid shape. Um, yeah. So that's what I'm working on. Uh, that's it. I'll call it a day. Thanks for watching.